שלום. שלום לכולכם, אני אצטרך לעבור לדבר באנגלית, אז אני מקווה שהדברים יהיו ברורים. Again, good afternoon. I am Itamar Evan Zohar and I will be your moderator for this joyful happening today. It is a great honor and pleasure to welcome our distinguished guest, Professor Alex Mesudi, as well as our eminent panelists, professors, professors Eva Yablonka, Amot Zahavi, Arie Altman, and Arnon Lotem, who are all present in the, in the room, and they will turn up uh, in time. Professor Mesudi is currently reader, it's a funny, funny title, only current in England, but I won't translate it to the R hierarchy, academic hierarchy, in the Department of Anthropology and member of the Behavior, Ecology and Evolution Research Center and of the Center for the Co-Evolution of Biology and Culture at Durham University, England. In a few weeks, however, he will be moving to the University of Exeter's Department of Biology, joining there the Human Biological and Cultural Evolution Group. Something unthinkable in such a university as Tel Aviv or Jerusalem or Haifa or Be'er Sheva, you know, a person who has earned his PhD in psychology at the University of St. Andrews uh, worked at the Department of Psychology at, in London, um, I believe went to the States for the Department of Archaeology, Archaeology, then went to Durham for Anthropology, and now is moving to Biology in Exeter. So think about such a trajectory which is very symbolic for the topic that will be discussed in our meeting today. He's here at Tel Aviv University as a guest of the Sackler Institute um, of Advanced Studies and the Unit of Culture Research. And I wish to express my gratitude to professors Yablonka, Zahavi, and Lotem for their support in making his visit possible. Alex Mesudi has been in the last decade one of the moving spirits of cultural evolution. In the course of very few years, he has made remarkable contributions, intensively collaborating with colleagues to the rising field of cultural evolution in studies on transmission and learning and in developing experimental methods, mathematical models, and computer simulations. But above all, he has been active in promoting the idea of a scientific synthesis in the social sciences similar to the one that has taken place in biology to make the creation of an interdisciplinary science of culture possible. As Joseph Henrik has put it on the back cover of Mesudi's book, Cultural Evolution, How Darwinian Theory Can Explain Human Culture and Synthesize the Social Sciences, a book that I hope will be translated into Hebrew. I quote, for just over a quarter century, scattered groups of renegade evolutionary social scientists, remember the word renegade, it will pop up a few times today, have been quietly hammering away in the remote corners of anthropology, archaeology, biology, psychology, and economics to forge a fully Darwinian approach to culture. In elegantly assembling and synthesizing these disparate and often highly technical efforts, Mesudi has turned on the lights and put out the welcome mat, the interdisciplinary science of culture for the 21st century is open for business. As someone coming from culture research, for me, the deep renegade meaning of this prospective synthesis lies precisely in the ability to overcome thinking in terms of fragmented knowledge about humans and other animals 
constrained by the barriers between all of those disciplines commonly known as anthropology, archaeology, biology, psychology, and the rest. This is per se not a new idea. In the course of the history of science, we have witnessed alternate waves of synthesis and fragmentation. In the 20th century, the movement for the unification of science, initiated by Otto Neurath, consisted of members from a large range of disciplines. Scientism, in various degrees of adequacy, has permeated remote parts of the humanities and the social sciences. The most recent endeavor has been cultural semiotics, as well as semiotics at large, which has attempted since the 1960s at a convergence of the disparate branches of knowledge. Among the most heroic attempts, I should mention the work of Yuri Lotman, who developed a semiotic theory he called semiosphere, much inspired by Vernadsky's biosphere. Other attempts, such as Thomas Sibiok's zoo semiotics, or zoo semiotics, should perhaps also be mentioned. However, none of these has gained ground and consistent research, and none can be said, in my humble opinion, to have lived up to the conceptual and methodical, methodological level opened by cultural evolution since the pioneering works of Luigi Cavalli Sforza, Marcus Feldman, Robert Boyd, and Peter Richardson, and their students and followers, among whom Alex Mesudi has certainly already assumed a prominent position. I would like now to invite Professor Alex Mesudi to give his talk about, the title is, Towards a Science of Culture Within a Darwinian Evolutionary Framework. After his talk, we will have a panel discussion with our panelists and concluding remarks by Professor Mesudi. Our session ends at 6.45, so we must now proceed without delay. I was asked to remind you not to be alarmed by the siren sound at 7.05. give a brief um, overview of this field of cultural evolution that I've had a small part in over the last uh, couple of decades. It's really taken off, uh, so I'll start talking about the basic principles of cultural evolution, what it is, what we mean when we say cultural evolution, and then I'll move towards what Isamar was saying about how some of us think maybe it could be a synthesizing force within the social sciences and provide some kind of way of linking together the different social sciences that are um, lamentably uh, so uh, fragmented, uh, have been so fragmented for, for so long. Uh, and I, and I should, should say that much of this, or all of this really is uh, in the book that I published uh, a few years ago, uh, which is a, a synthesis of the field and uh, an explanation of how this could be uh, an evolutionary framework. So I'll start uh, maybe with a, a broader biological picture, trying to put um, these issues into a broader perspective. Uh, so humans are a quite uh, a distinctive, unusual uh, species. So this uh, figure, hopefully everyone can see it. I don't know if we need the lights down. Lights down, yes? Maybe. Um, so this uh, figure is from a paper from a few years back where the authors um, uh, compiled what they called the great human expansion. So humans are quite uh, unusual in having spread across the world in an unusually uh, brief evolutionary uh, period of uh, 
time. So you can see the dates in thousands of years ago when Homo sapiens spread out of Africa, uh, from southern Africa and then uh, out of East Africa into the Middle East, um, into Asia, uh, Europe, Australia, for, and then across the Bering Strait into North and South America. So the first interesting thing is that this is you know, remarkably fast in evolutionary terms. So really in just 60,000 years, our species colonized pretty much every terrestrial environment on the planet. And the second interesting thing is that all of these environments are pretty diverse. So if you think about the deserts of the Kalahari or the deserts of Australia, um, the Pacific the Island, uh, Pacific Islands, um, the um, uh, Arctic tundra of the Bering Strait, the Great Plains of North America, the uh, tropical rainforest of South America, humans have adapted pretty well to all of these environments. Uh, so the big question that anthropologists have been grappling with over many, many years is why that's what's, what's interesting, what's special about our species, which has let us uh, colonize and inhabit successfully pretty much every terrestrial environment uh, on the planet. And then it gets more interesting if you think maybe more recently. Uh, so we not only have we um, inhabited successfully every environment, but we've transformed and changed every environment that we've uh, been in to the, such an extent that some geographers are claiming that we now need to call this ge geographical um, epoch or need to have a new geological epoch the Anthropocene uh, which entails which encompasses all of the human activities like agriculture invented a few thousand years ago uh, the Colombian exchange exchange of people and ideas and uh, diseases um, from the old world to the new world and back and forth the industrial revolution so all of these have had uh, pretty dramatic uh, changes uh, on our planet. So uh, spike in uh, global temperatures, increase in carbon dioxide, increase in methane, uh, and all of these are human-directed um, activities. So not only have we sort of adapted uh, successfully to different environments, we've transformed them and we're transforming our, um, uh, our planet. So the answer that, so there are many answers if anyone's familiar with anthropology, there's a long list of things that humans do well. But the answer that uh, cultural evolution folk um, uh, propose is uh, something that may not be a huge surprise to many social, some social scientists, but the answer is uh, culture, specifically uh, cumulative cultural evolution. So I'll come to that in a moment, but when um, cultural evolution folks say culture, they mean a very broad, they use it in a very broad uh, term to mean any kind of socially learned or socially transmitted information so much more broad much broader than most definitions of culture within the social sciences of which there are uh, hundreds uh, but we mean it in a broader sense so colloquially things like knowledge attitudes skills norms beliefs everything that we learn from other individuals um, can be stored in brains that uh, that are acquired through imitation language teaching uh, everything that's acquired non non genetically so these are the, the kind of things that let us live in dramatically different environments like the Arctic Circle, its you know, clothing, its harpoons, its fishing hooks, um, versus different kinds of technologies that let us live in tropical rainforests, so bows and arrows, and, and ecological knowledge. These are all, all things that we learn from, uh, from other people. There are no genes for harpoons or genes for bows and arrows. These are all learned uh, capacities. Uh, and also things like agriculture, uh, rests on learned, uh, learned knowledge, scientific knowledge leading to great technological advances. Again, this is all encompassed within this uh, broad term culture, but not just technical things, also um, the beliefs and norms that we um, transmit from one, person, uh, uh, from one person to another that bind communities together. So this isn't a, just a technical thing, it's also very much a social thing. Um, so. Again, to put it in a broader biological perspective, so many species exhibit um, social learning. Many species learn things from one another. Um, so famous examples include uh, honeybees, which uh, do these uh, amazing waggle dances to communicate the direction and um, uh, distance of food sources to each other. That's social learning. Uh, fish uh, shoal through their shoaling. Will, um, they can follow other fish to uh, food sources or to nesting sites. Uh, bird song is another excellent example. Many bird species uh, learn songs as they, well, they're juvenile uh, from their fathers. Uh, and uh, getting a bit closer to humans, many uh, great ape species like these chimpanzees will learn uh, tool use behaviors from each other. So this juvenile chimp is 
learning uh, nut cracking. Uh, so there's a nut down here, and his mother is um, cracking it open with um, with a log. It looks like there, but also with a stone. So all of these are not, certainly not claiming that social learning is uniquely human, and you find social learning across many taxa, across many many different species. You also find lots of examples. Um, in other species of what's been called, what have been called cultural traditions. So this is defined as a group differences, differences between different populations uh, that can be explained by social learning. So Andy Whiten's uh, famous work with chimpanzees has shown this. So he showed that some chimpanzee communities will, for example, uh, exhibit nut cracking. So they'll um, uh, crack open nuts with uh, with logs and, and stones, whereas other communities, even though they've got access to nuts and stones and, and logs, they don't do that. Uh, and different kinds of ant fishing or termite fishing, where they put sticks in uh, ants' nests or termites' uh, nests and pull them out and eat the ants or termites off the end, there are different ways of doing this. And again, this varies between groups of chimpanzees. And the argument is that these differences arise through social learning. So they're learning different techniques in different groups, or in one group they're learning the technique, and in another group they're not uh, learning that particular technique. Maybe much like uh, different human groups might use knives and forks or chopsticks. These are similar kinds of um, uh, traditions, cultural traditions. Uh, but when we come to humans, only humans seem to accumulate cultural information over generations. So this is where we start getting into cultural evolution. So even though something like nutcracking is a very clever um, thing to do, and chimpanzees will um, uh, acquire it from another chimpanzee through observation, it's not outside the realms of possibility that a single chimpanzee could, in, on its own, invent nutcracking, given enough time and given nuts and uh, given rocks. Whereas the kind of things that we learn from each other um, it's vanishingly unlikely that any of us could invent uh, the kind of things that we acquire uh, from other, other people uh, alone. So if you think about sticking with percussive technology, you know, we've gone from uh, rocks um, to adding handles on them and then making them out of different materials and differently designed hammers here up, up to industrial hammers from the Industrial Revolution. Um, or telephones might be another technological example going from uh, telegrams through to landlines through to increasingly small and sophisticated uh, smartphones. So the smartphone here has a GPS in and um, can measure my heart rates and you know, nobody could um, alone invent something like a smartphone. It's accumulated over many, many previous generations. So these modifications are, are being preserved and accumulated. So we're benefiting from many previous generations um, uh, knowledge, hard-won knowledge. So it's basically encapsulated in uh, what Isaac Newton uh, famously said, and he stole it from somebody else, um, but he famously said, if I've seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. So uh, the, the advances that Newton made, as great as they were, were only possible because he was building on the mathematical advances, physics advances of many, many previous generations, the Greeks, the Arab scholars, uh, and so on. So that's it's this idea of accumulating knowledge over successive generations uh, that lies at the heart of, of, of cultural evolution. What seems to be what uh, makes uh, humans um, uh, special in the sense of uh, being able to acquire um, knowledge uh, and build up knowledge over successive generations to be able to adapt, not genetically, but culturally, to different environments. Uh, so that's the basic idea of, of uh, cumulative uh, cultural evolution. So we can maybe step, take a step back and what do we mean by evolution, because lots of people of uh, different conceptions of, um, uh, of, of the term evolution, the word evolution. So when we say uh, cultural evolution, this idea that culture evolves, socially transmitted things evolve, we're essentially arguing that you can apply uh, the basic principles that Darwin came up with in The Origin of Species to culture, to socially learn things. Uh, so in The Origin of Species, Darwin put forward a theory of evolution which basically had three um, components. You need some kind of variation, so there's variation between entities. You need some kind of what Darwin called a struggle for existence, which we might call maybe selection now. So <clears throat> an idea that not all variants, not all um, uh, traits are equally likely to persist, equally likely to survive. And some kind of inheritance, uh, which is the mechanism by which um, uh, certain variants get uh, transmitted um, uh, to subsequent generations. And the important thing is to 
remember that um, Darwin knew nothing about genes or genetic inheritance. So often you see definitions of evolution uh, which say something like changes in gene frequencies over time or talk about genetic inheritance or Mendelian inheritance. Actually, Darwin didn't know anything about that. Um, uh, Mendel had done his experiments separately, and Darwin famously hadn't uh, had been sent Mendel's books, but hadn't read them because the pages were uncut. Um, and in fact, he had all kinds of weird ideas about inheritance. He actually, he was a Lamarckian, so he believed in blending inheritance and use and disuse, and very <coughs> ideas that uh, modern geneticists would um, uh, would would reject. Um, but Darwin knew nothing about genes, so the inheritance doesn't have to be. Uh, genetic, all you need is some kind of inheritance. Um, uh, it doesn't have to be particulate, or it doesn't have to be uh, gene-like. So that opens up the possibility that we can apply his theory to cultural change. So if social learning is of sufficiently high fidelity to preserve information over successive generations, that idea of accumulation of knowledge over successive generations, then <coughs> cultural evolution can take off. So we've still evolving biologically, genetically, but we simply have this other cultural evolutionary process which results in the technologies and the social institutions and the social norms uh, that have accumulated over many, many generations and has made us so uh, successful as a species. Um, and so this isn't a new idea uh, by any means. In fact, Darwin had it um, back in the uh, mid-19th century, so soon after Darwin wrote The Origin of Species, applying this theory to, uh, to species, to biological uh, organisms, he almost immediately applied it to a, a, cultural, uh, a cultural trait, so language in this case. Uh, so the formation of different <coughs> languages and of distinct species, and the proofs that both have been developed through a gradual process, by which he means evolution really, are curiously parallel. Uh, the survival or preservation of certain favored words in the struggle for existence is natural selection. So here we might maybe call it, I would probably call it cultural selection to distinguish it from natural selection. <clears throat> but he was basically arguing that the same process, the same theory that can explain uh, biological evolution uh, also explains language evolution. Of course, the languages that we learn are socially transmitted, socially learned, whether it's Hebrew or English or Swahili or whatever, we learn these from other people. Uh, and so he argued that language also evolves. And actually, the social sciences were quite, um, uh, it was quite common to, um, uh, to propose these kinds of theories back in the, uh, <coughs> the mid to late uh, 1800s. So uh, Augustus Pitt Rivers was an archaeologist. If anyone's been to Oxford, may have been to the Pitt Rivers uh, Archaeological Museum. Uh, so Pitt Rivers was innovative in not cataloging uh, artifacts, not by collector or by time period or by region necessarily, but by what he thought were evolutionary relationships. So this is one scheme that Pitt Rivers came up with. So you start off with a, a stick and it evolves into a club or a shield or a <coughs> harpoon or a boomerang. And you know, it's, these are different sort of evolutionary lineages of artifacts connected by uh, social learning, connected by uh, cultural, uh, cultural descent. Uh, early historical linguists as well, <coughs> like August Feicher here, uh, created uh, big evolutionary trees of languages, this is the Indo-European language family that he took a best guess at. Uh, again, directly inspired, as you can see by the title, uh, by, uh, by Darwin. So again, building on Darwin's throwaway comment, really, in The Descent of Man, and trying to actually apply evolutionary ideas to things like technology, things like languages that are uh, socially learned uh, traits. Uh, then there was a bit of a, a wrong step in the, the history of cultural evolution. So a couple of founders of really uh, anthropology, so E.B. Tyler in the UK and uh, Lewis Henry Morgan in uh, the United States, who are sometimes considered founder, founding fathers of anthropology, sadly took um, a, a different kind of evolutionary scheme and applied it to culture. So rather than Darwin's uh, branching um, <coughs> idea of, sort of branching lineages and diversification and Darwin's focus on uh, sort of small-scale details, variation and inheritance and selection, sadly they took <coughs> um, Herbert Spencer's ideas of, of ladders, of uh, increasing complexity or stage-like theories where uh, species go through different stages and they proposed rather dubious evolutionary, uh, so-called evolutionary schemes where all entire societies pass through uh, discrete stages, which is still an idea that's quite common in the social sciences, this idea of uh, this version of evolution. So they argue just societies start off in states of savagery and then they progress through 
to different stages of barbarism, and then, uh, lo and behold, they make it up to civilization, which happens to be white Victorian uh, or American English-speaking civilization. So this was a wrong step because, well, you can, there were obvious political uh, connotations, but it's, this isn't really evolution as either Darwin or modern biologists would recognize it. This is a sort of stage-like scheme of increasing complexity, whereas Darwin's theory was all, all about branching diversification and pro uh, the, 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 the individual level processes that are going on within populations to cause change, whereas these <coughs> rather crude schemes, there's not really any explanation for why societies push, are pushed along these ladders and it's empirically untenable, as well as Boas and Kroger and others argued later on, societies just don't go through these uh, different stages. So as a result of that, many anthropologists quite rightly rejected these kinds of theories, but also rejected any kind of evolutionary uh, approach to culture. So skipping ahead about uh, 100 years or so, uh, there was a brief interest in memetics. Uh, so many people have probably heard of uh, memes which uh, Dawkins, Richard Dawkins coined in the, the selfish gene at the end of the selfish gene to try and illustrate the idea that, um, that uh, his replicator theory is, is uh, not uh, restricted to genes. You can have other replicators. So they came up with this idea of a meme. Uh, and memetics was the idea that um, cultural change is the differential replication of different memes. <coughs> and memes has kind of caught on as a catchy idea on the internet, uh, strangely. Um, it never really took off as a productive or empirical science. It's probably because it was too tightly constrained to a genetic model. So it's forcing cultural change into, um, into having discrete units like genes and having gen genetic-like inheritance when most of the time culture just doesn't fit that genetic model. Uh, so that was, again, caught the public imagination, I guess, but was an uh, academic dead end. Really what um, was really the founding of, uh, foundation of the field of cultural evolution, as I have written about it and, and many other people have, was, as Itamar said, in the 1980s uh, with these uh, quantitative mathematical models of cultural evolution. So back in the 20s and 30s, biologists quantify, mathematicize biology, basically, and that's when biology uh, kind of took off. Uh, so uh, in cultural evolution, that was done in the uh, beginning in the 70s, but mostly in the 1980s with Luca Cavalli, so much, Feldman <coughs> in 1981, Pete Richardson and Robert Boyd in 1985, where they tried to create mathematical models of cultural evolution using the kind of same kind of mathematics that population geneticists did. But maybe more importantly, they took seriously the differences between cultural and genetic evolution. So they drew on findings from psychology and anthropology and sociology uh, as best they could to try and come up with the unique dynamics that cultural evolution has that may be very different to uh, the way in which biological or genetic evolution uh, uh, occurs. Um, and so that was the, really the, the kind of foundation, I would say, of, of cultural evolution. So the, many of these models were concerned with what we might describe as microevolution. So in biology, microevolution is all about the, the processes that change gene frequencies uh, within populations. So biologists have a, a kind of menu, a catalog of different processes that they draw on to explain uh, evolutionary change, things like natural selection, sexual selection, uh, gene flow, or migration. Uh, mutation, recombination, drift, weird things like meiotic drive. So <coughs> there's not a single sort of, some people think it's, you know, it's all selection, uh, but actually there's lots of different processes that biologists invoke to explain uh, biological change. Well, similarly, these guys, Boyd Richardson, Cavalli, Swartzer, and Feldman, created models where they had a similar but um, different uh, set of uh, cultural microevolutionary processes, things that they thought uh, drive cultural change, so colloquially, yeah, who, were, who learns what from whom and how, how do people transform ideas as they pass them from person to person. So uh, the next few slides I'll go through a few of these um, examples, but things like content bias, model-based biases, frequency-dependent bias, guided variation, which is the idea that uh, cultural mutation isn't random, people in, uh, intentionally create ideas with a goal in mind, which is perfectly amenable to evolutionary analysis, migration, people taking ideas with them, and uh, ideas of cultural drift. So to go through those first three in a bit more detail, uh, content bias, to give you an idea of the kind of explanations that cultural evolution people invoke. So content bias is probably the most uh, similar to uh, natural selection, probably. You might call it cultural selection. 
this is where some traits are intrinsically more uh, uh, likely to be learned than others. Some traits are intrinsically more memorable or more effective or more efficient. There's some kind of advantage to one trait over another. So we might uh, look at uh, uh, linguistics, for example. So maybe uh, regular past tense forms of words are more memorable, more easy to learn than irregular past tenses. This is the verb to chide, uh, which uh, these guys used uh, the, all the um, massive databases of uh, literature that Google have catalogued and scanned and uh, quantified to show that uh, the regular form chided has been increasing in frequency, whereas chid or chowed have been decreasing in frequency. Or maybe we can draw on um, uh, work from so that sociologists have done, classic work on the diffusion of innovation. So this is hybrid seed corn spreading through the United States. Farmers in Iowa, I think it was, in the 20s and 30s, 1920s, 1930s. So the hybrid seed corn is, is, has a higher yield than the previous uh, corn. And so you can see it spread uh, through the population. So that's maybe more, most similar to a kind of selection like account, but it's not all kind of deterministic or it's not all this thing is good and this thing is not so good and so the good thing spreads. We also have maybe more psychological biases like uh, what's called prestige bias, uh, where we preferentially adopt traits exhibited by prestigious or high status uh, individuals. Uh, so the idea here, models show that this can be a useful shortcut to acquiring adaptive behavior. So rather than figuring out you know, playing around with this, the corn or the, uh, the different things that you're using, the arrowheads or the hand axes, you just do whatever the most prestigious, high status person in your group is doing. Uh, but then that can sometimes go wrong when you don't get the right thing. So back in the UK, a few World Cups ago, David Beckham got that ridiculous uh, mohawk uh, hairstyle. And then there was a spate of copycat mohawk hairstyles that swept the country. Uh, and the idea is that this is a kind of a similar kind of thing. It's probably a good idea to copy David Beckham because he's successful and rich and uh, an excellent footballer, but his hairstyle probably had little to do with uh, his uh, footballing skills. So this is a kind of broad prestige bias gone wrong. Uh, and advertisers know this, so advertisers will pay celebrities to endorse their products. My favorite is Ronaldinho, again, the footballer and photocopiers, uh, what the connection is between Ronaldinho and photocopiers, I don't know, but it's, it seems to work. It's this kind of, we, we copy things that prestigious people uh, do. Uh, and conformity is another one that's uh, taken from social, the social psychology literature. So preferentially adopting a trait just based on its popularity. Again, irrespective of what it is, um, you just um, do what the majority do. You just copy uh, what most people in your, your group uh, do. So I don't know if you can see, but all of these people, unlike you guys, have uh, Apple Macs. Uh, almost everybody in the audience, maybe they've independently arrived at the decision that Macs are better than PCs, but maybe there's a kind of conformity, uh, social conformity kind of effect going on. This has interesting effects, like even weak conformity can generate strong within-group cultural homogeneity. So um, you get uh, sort of uniform uh, traits within groups, and if different groups have different traits, then you get between group, uh, strong between group variation, which can maybe lead to selection between groups based on their traits. There's been lots of these cultural group selection uh, models looking at this, this more social uh, uh, reason for adopting traits. Uh, so how are these uh, studied in the field? So like I mentioned, um, the, the early work, so Boyd, Richardson, Cavalli, Schwartz, and Feldman basically tried to mathematicize, basically quantify these kind of processes in mathematical models uh, in order to study them in a, a quantitative way, much like biologists did in the 20s and 30s with processes like natural selection or drift. So I won't talk about this in any detail, but this is a model of conformity which they get an equation out of, and you can vary the strength of conformity and predict how something should spread through a society based on different levels of conformity. So this is very conformist, this is not very conformist, and you can map that up to, say, the hybrid seed corn diffusion curves and try and um, uh, invoke different levels of conformity or say how much conformity was responsible for the spread of a particular, uh, a particular trait through a society. So these quantitative models basically mathematicize um, these, these purported uh, decision rules, learning dynamics. You can also use uh, experiments, which is common in psychology, but not so common in other social science uh, disciplines. That's the kind of thing that I do. Um, so I run uh, lots of experiments in collaboration with archaeologists. So we try and simulate cultural change 
uh, in the lab. So we get, I get people to design, play computer games, and they design arrowheads, or they design hand axes, or they carve hand axes out of blocks of polystyrene. And then they can copy the different traits from each other to try and simulate these different kinds of learning, social learning biases. So in this uh, video, it should be working. Uh, so this is a screenshot of somebody playing one of my computer games where this is their arrowhead, and they can either change the uh, arrowhead dimensions directly in the top, or they can do what this person has done, and they can choose to copy the most successful other player in the room, so they're all playing in a computer network uh, in a room. So this person is, uh, and we show them their scores in this particular case, and they're uh, exhibiting a kind of success bias, so they're copying a successful person or high status uh, person in the group, and then they've done very well out of copy and they get bits of bison or and they get paid at the end of it. So the idea here is that we can use experiments to simulate past cultural change in particular and do things that archaeologists, for example, or historians uh, can't do. So we can look at the, um, as I mentioned, the adaptiveness of social learning. So when does social learning pay? So in this graph on the left here, um, you can see so this is different hunts along the bottom, different trials, time, um, and this is the score that people get, which turn into money at the end, and you can, the blue people here can copy each other at the very end in these last five months, and you can see copying is kind of a good thing uh, to do in this particular case. So the social learners, the people copying other people, uh, outperform and get more money than uh, the people in black here who couldn't copy each other at all. Uh, and we can uh, sort of examine the conditions under which this holds. So this only happens when we have a kind of multimodal adaptive landscape. So again, borrowing an idea from biology, a kind of design space of technology where you have different kinds of different uh, arrowheads, different optimal arrowheads, and some optimal arrowheads are better than others, so some are lower peaks than other peaks. And um, the reason social learning does well here is because if you're not copying anyone else, you can get trapped on a, a sort of local optima um, uh, that's not so good, whereas if you can copy somebody else who's found a better arrowhead in the design space, then you can jump and uh, your score jumps up. But then if we change the landscape to just have a single peak, then that advantage disappears, and these orange people are uh, individual learners uh, who score just as well as the social learners. So the key point is that we can do things like change, change the kind of what makes an arrowhead good, uh, change the shape of the fitness landscape in a way that archaeologists can't do. So you can't go back in time and play around with this and do these kinds of manipulations. And we can also match it to actual archaeological uh, data. So this is what with the archaeologist uh, Mike O'Brien in Missouri that I did. Uh, where, so these are um, arrowheads, tips of arrows, uh, and in California, uh, archaeologists have found that there's lots of uh, diversity in the arrowheads that have been found in California. So this is from around 1,500 years ago, which we argue was because maybe there's more individual learning going on, there's sort of barriers to copying, which may be social barriers, which means that everybody's diversifying, whereas in Nevada, from the same time period, from the same... Um, using the same material, same, um, same prey species. Uh, despite all those similarities, there's lots of uniformity in the, the Nevadan arrowhead designs, which we argue may, might be because of this prestige by social learning. So everyone's copying the, the David Beckham of arrowhead makers in that group, and there's a different uh, uh, successful person in that group which might uh, change the kind of variation. So we're mapping sort of learning dynamics that psychologists might talk about, like conformity or payoff bias, social learning, to broad um, patterns that archaeologists, long-term, long large-scale patterns of data that archaeologists obtain from the archaeological record. And a final example, also uh, lots of uh, field studies. I guess you could call it quantitative ethnography, maybe. So this is a, a study by um, Joe and Natalie Henrich um, in Fiji. So they looked at food taboos in uh, a small Fijian uh, fishing community where uh, women in this community have food taboos against eating large fish when, like this eel, if you can see that, uh, where, uh, when they're pregnant and when they're breastfeeding. And the reason for this is um, uh, because uh, there's a naturally occurring toxin and the toxin concentrates up the food chain into the top large predator fish and so there's a, a chance of miscarriage, high chance of miscarriage if women eat these large fish uh, uh, while they're pregnant or while they're, um, uh, while they're pregnant in particular. Um, and so what um, Henrich and Henrich did, they interviewed everybody in the community, they tried to figure out how people learned these food taboos 
who, who, these, who these people, uh, who people learned their food taboos from. Uh, and this is a, a social network analysis that they did. It's two different villages, and the, each dot is a different person, and the size of the dot is that represents the number of people that uh, went to that person to learn the food taboo. And the key point is that some people are bigger than others. So these big circles are what they found were prestigious, wise women. So again, you get this prestige kind of effect. Uh, very old women are kind of repositories of knowledge, and they found that um, you know, there's no sort of genetically evolved module in the women's brains that uh, makes them avoid big fish. It's a cultural effect. It's, uh, 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 it's biologically adaptive, but it's persi it persists due to cultural learning, due to people uh, specifically learning from specific, uh, specific people. So again, it's, it's, it's adaptive, but the reason it's adaptive is, is because of the dynamics of how we learn from each other and who we learn from. Um, so that's all about sort of microevolution, who we, who we learn from within populations. Biologists, of course, also uh, do lots of work on macroevolution. So again, this comes from uh, Darwin. So this is a sketch of Darwin way before the origin of species, where he first laid out his idea of branching um, diversification of species. And this is the, the only figure in the origin of species, which is a, a branching, diversing, uh, divers, diversifying uh, a tree, basically, of, of different species, how he thought evolution occurred. And modern uh, contemporary biologists or modern biologists uh, have all kinds of sophisticated phylogenetic methods for basically building on Darwin's insights and often using genetic data since gene sequencing to reconstruct big evolutionary trees of different species. These are mammalian uh, species here, and so you can figure out the, the relatedness between each, uh, each species. So cultural evolution folk have also um, got in on this uh, action as well. So cultural macroevolution researchers um, have applied the same kinds of phylogenetic uh, methods to cultural data sets based on the same insights. So this is no, it's no longer genetic inheritance, it's cultural inheritance based on, based on that principle of inheritance. So this is, uh, you won't be able to see the, the names, but this is an Indo-European language family. So updating, uh, so Gray and uh, Atkinson here were updating Stryker's very informal Indo-European language tree that he wrote by hand in 1863 using rather sophisticated um, I think Bayesian phylogenetic uh, analyses here to reconstruct Indo-European uh, languages and doing clever things like adding geography to it and uh, figuring out that it's uh, Indo-European languages seem to have, or the most plausible hypothesis is that Indo-European languages spread from Anatolia, from modern, modern Turkey, uh, around 8,000 to 9,000 years ago, which is consistent with the origin of agriculture. So they, they argue um, uh, Indo-European languages spread out with early farmers um, and took their language as well as their farming uh, cultural traits uh, with them. You can also do it with uh, folk tales, maybe linking to another discipline perhaps. This is my colleague at Durham, uh, Jamie Tirani's analysis or phylogeny of Little Red Riding Hood. So it turns out there's lots of different versions of Little Red Riding Hood um, across the world. So there are Asian versions and African versions. The Asian versions have tigers in them and uh, all kinds of interesting differences between them. But he uh, quantified all the different motifs in the story and then applied these phylogenetic analyses to find that they branch kind of um, with geography, but with interesting uh, exceptions that you wouldn't expect. So this is the European uh, Red Riding Hood story that maybe we're familiar with. Uh, this is an East Asian version or branch of the tree. This is an African version. Uh, and so you have different, um, uh, different branchings. It doesn't have to be a, literally a tree-like thing. This is more, more bush-like, um, but it's, it's for quantifying um, the kind of data that uh, folklorists have collected um, and uh, adding a bit more rigor to the way in which you can calculate or you can uh, reconstruct a cultural evolutionary history. And my final example, um, kind of uh, moving into history maybe, so this is a paper from a couple of years ago by uh, Peter Turchin um, uh, and his colleagues where they looked at the spread of empires, the spread of polities. Uh, so they created a, a quantitative, spatially explicit simulation of empire expansion. Um, so it's probably make any historians in the audience um, very angry and uh, maybe leave the room, but it's a, a simple model as they could, uh, they could think of. So they created a, a, kind of a geographically accurate version of um, Eurasia and Africa, and they had their empires in the model spread via socially learned military technology, 
uh, horses, I think, was the, the main thing that they, they looked at, and also internal cooperation, so a social trait. So internally cooperative societies are more likely to be able to invade and conquest uh, less internally cooperative societies. Um, and I can show the video here. So on the right here is uh, the data, the actual historical data about empires and polities. And on the left is their computer simulation. And they argued that there was a quite a surprisingly high degree of match between where you would predict based on this, these very simple, you know, just a, a couple of uh, parameters in, in the model there, plus some realistic geography, um, where the, the, the simulated empires appear and where actual empires appear. Of course, it's not perfect, and it's interesting to think about why it's not perfect, and there's all kinds of things that are not in the model, and it's a hugely simplified version of reality, um, but it's, um, it's, uh, they argue that the benefits of having a quantitative model kind of forces historians to be specific about the, the kind of processes that they think um, might uh, uh, cause uh, the spread of large, large-scale societies as well. So it's kind of incursion into into history. Okay, so that's a very brief, rushed um, tour through the the basic ideas of cultural evolution, the kind of work that people are doing. So as you can see, it's kind of going into different disciplines, into archaeology and history, and it uses ideas from psychology and sociology. So, can we say, as, as Itamar was saying in the introduction, does this constitute a science of, of cultural evolution? So I've argued that um, uh, we should encourage this kind of science of cultural evolution. I should be clear that the vast majority of social scientists completely reject uh, any kind of quantitative or um, uh, uh, scientific or uh, particularly evolutionary approach to studying cultural change. Uh, on the one hand, or you get economists who are very quantitative but tend not to look at culture and tend to ignore social learning. So um, it's, it's certainly, as Itama was saying at the beginning, a fringe pursuit of different disciplines. Uh, but it's kind of interesting to see everybody uh, coming together. Um, and it's kind of, uh, before that, so it's, it's kind of um, taking off, I guess, as a discipline. So this is published papers from the Web of Science database that use the term cultural evolution, and you can see this is 1970 here and 2014 uh, here, and you can see around about 1999, I think 2000, uh, there was this takeoff, a uh, bit of a blip last year, but it's back up to where it should be, but we're kind of uh, taking off, and these are citations, people who um, cite all of this work, and this is, uh, again, pretty dramatic rise, really in the last couple of, uh, couple of decades which is kind of encouraging, and this is a map that I tried to put together of everybody who I thought um, would uh, be happy to self-describe as a cultural evolution researcher and who has a facu permanent faculty position. Uh, so you can see it's, it's well, sadly dominated by the UK and the US as many other disciplines, but it's kind of an international pursuit. I put um, Ava here as a, a cultural evolution researcher because you've written uh, great stuff on cultural evolution. I'm hoping maybe there's other people I don't know about in Israel. Um, but it's, it's, it's quite an international, just clustered in one country. You can't describe it as the X school where X is a particular country. Um, it's, it's kind of a, a diaspora, if you like, of uh, cultural evolution uh, researchers. And then I sort of um, tallied up the disciplines, the departmental affiliations that all of these people uh, have on their websites or on their papers, and again, it's quite broad, which I think is fairly uh, unusual for a, a theoretical uh, perspective. So we've got anthropologists, archaeologists, biologists, economists, um, linguists, mathematicians, uh, psychologists, sociologists. Yeah, we're all, as Itamar said, or Joe Henrich said, we're all at the fringes of our disciplines, but we're all uh, would all be happy talking to each other and working within the same framework and cite each other and. Um, and, and use each other's work uh, in a way that I think is, is sadly rare in the, the social sciences where you have these silos of different disciplines with their own jargon and who tend not to, to talk to each other. Uh, so in my book I end it with a maybe overly optimistic but uh, or maybe pro overly provocative um, idea that maybe this idea of interdisciplinary work is kind of inherent in uh, using this evolutionary framework. So in biology uh, in the 1930s and 40s, different branches of biology kind of came together. Uh, so you've got botany and paleobiology and lab experiments with fruit flies and mathematical models and everything, all came together within a synthetic science of evolutionary biology. The things that were missing 
um, as maybe we'll hear about later, but they, it kind of evolutionary biology kind of came together as a discipline far more than the social sciences currently are. So I tried to maybe um, use that as a guide and map on different uh, branches uh, of the social sciences, uh, probably imperfectly, but um, onto the different pursuits in biology. So for example, we might see archaeology or history as the analogy uh, uh, to paleobiology, studying fossil record versus studying past cultural inheritance or past uh, cultural material record. Um, or the lab experiments that we do, I do in psychology, might be equivalent to the, uh, the lab experiments that biologists run with fruit flies or E. coli or whatever, the same kind of theoretical models, uh, field studies, uh, and so on. And the advantage of having everybody within this synthetic framework is that we're all kind of talking to each other and uh, you know, I'm simulating in the lab things that archaeologists are finding or that ethnographers are finding um, in the field and there's this exchange of ideas and exchange of, of concepts. Um, so maybe that's a point for discussion, um, but some people um, have taken this as um, uh, quite a nice thing, other people uh, vehemently reject it. Okay, so that's uh, where I'll, I'll stop, so hopefully that's uh, some food for thought. Just uh, leaves me to acknowledge uh, Itamar again and the Sackler Institute for hosting me, my institutions and funders, and uh, key people who've shaped my thinking uh, over the years. So thank you for your attention.